This is the PixInsight process tutorial for the dynamic background extraction. You can find this process in Process, Background Modelization and Dynamic Background Extraction. Before we start looking into this process in detail, just a few general comments. The Dynamic Background Extraction is one of the first processes that PixInsight had. So it has a very long history and it's probably one of the reasons why PixInsight actually exists and got so successful. Based on that, it's also one of the most widely used processes. And so compared to other processes where I actually have a hard time finding anything on the web describing what they do, here it's a wealth of information. There is almost no YouTuber in the astro sector which has not done a dedicated video about the dynamic background extraction. So in the last days I have immersed myself in all of these videos and other information and I think what I got out of this is first of all how I used it until now and I think how probably a lot of people use it you only scratch the surface of this tool and what's really feasible. And I will use this tool very differently from now on than I used it in the past. Because what I got out of it is that each and every detail of this powerful tool has its purpose, has its reason. And in certain situations, it makes a lot of sense applying that. So there is no right, no wrong. There are no magic numbers. The key is to really understand this tool in detail and then being able to apply these all these features when it is needed. And with exactly this philosophy, I will also present you now this tool. So here I already have the picture open. It's a linear picture, practically I did nothing on it. As you can see, if I unstretch it, it's black. And what you also see if I hyperstretch it, here on the right side, there is some light pollution, which is not here on the left side. So we have some gradients, which actually flow through the whole picture and which are rather smooth, but we do not have any vignetting. So it's really just the basic removal of the light pollution, which we have to do here. So I will move it back now to a normal stretch face. So the dynamic background extraction is, as the name says, a dynamic process which means it is interactive with the picture. And there's not many processes in PixInsight which do that. So for example, to actually connect now the process with the picture, I just have to click into it. And you see these crosshairs appear, which means now we're connected. Whatever I do in the picture affects the process, and whatever I do in the process affects the picture. While the automatic background extractor does now the sampling and the background model, we in a brute force attempt, here in the dynamic background extraction, we have to generate the samples. So the first thing we have to understand is what is a sample? A sample we usually place at a point where there are no stars and no massive nebulosity. So for example, here between the stars, it's rather black. I click and I have a sample. So as you can see now, something happened here. First of all, it states that this is sample number one. It tells me the coordinates where it actually is, and it tells me the radius. I can change this radius, I can make it bigger. And if I do that, you see this square is now bigger and there's more pixels in here. So let's start with this. Should you have smaller samples or larger samples? And the answer is, depends. What I'm using for my pictures is a CBC 800. So I have a focal length of about 1300 millimeters, which means based on that, I usually do not have too many stars and I have wide open spaces where I can set these samples. So I can actually use easily bigger samples as it's easy to find places where I can place them without including a lot of stars. That might be much different than when you have a telescope with a small focal length and your picture is full of stars. So then you might actually need smaller sample sizes so that you can actually find places where to place them. That's just one reason. It could also be that we have to be careful to not affect the nebulosity and so on. 
So there's no correct answer how big these samples should be. They should be not too small, I would say not below 10. They should be not ridiculously big. So radius of a 30, why not? So the next thing that is interesting is this picture here. You see it's very colorful. And if I, for example, move the sample now on this star, what you see is that the star is completely black and even the areas around are very red, very dark. So what this means is, that areas which dark colors or even with black, they're actually disregarded from the model. What you should strive for is for areas that are relevant, that you that are background, that you want to have cleaned, harmonized, they should be as pale as possible. The other thing that you see here are the weights. This tells me to how much extent this sample will actually be used. And the more black tones I have in, the smaller the number is, the more irrelevant this sample is. So if I now put it again to a very black areas, you see I'm again at 0.75, which is much better than 0.5. So it's a percentage in principle. And I see that through all the colors. So this is the weight of red, of green, and of blue. So now that we know what samples are, the question is, how many of them do we need? And how do we distribute them? There are two fundamentally very different methods how you can do that. And depending on who you listen to, you hear that one or the other method is so much superior to the other. I feel, depending on the situation, one or the other might be better. So the first one I want to show you is the manual one. What it means is I simply look for nice places where I have the background, where I do not have many stars, and I place samples. So for example, here is a good place, here, 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 and so on. So I did set now samples all around the picture, but you see that I left out the whole nebulosity as good as possible. And that's very, very important. So the advantage of this method of setting the samples is that I can absolutely ensure that I have for each and every sample the perfect place with no stars, with no nebulosity. On the downside, it obviously is a lot of effort to set all these samples. I might also not be that evenly distributed. As you can see, we have now set 30 samples and I can with this keys move through them. And you see some are lighter, some are darker, but there's no real huge stars visible. Here, for example, there seems to be a star. So this is the number four. Let's see, it will appear in green. Here it is. So I can take that, move it a little bit. Okay, and the star is gone, so that's better. Otherwise, they look good. So the issue that we have now, and I think we see it very nicely, for example, here, that we have very dark colors and only 0.34 of the weight, so that's way too low. So how do we get rid of that? It's very easy, you go here in the model parameters one, and we increase now the tolerance. So for example, we can say two. And look at that, almost all these dark spots, they're gone and we're at the 0.9. So what do we do now? Let's start with the number one. We go through them and let's look at them. If we still have some which have a very low number. But that's actually not the case, so that's good. So the next one, shadow relaxation. What this is, is if a sample is at a very dark spot and there's a lot of light pollution, then actually this sample might be disregarded because it's atypical. The most ones are on the light pollution and then the tool would think, well, we, we should not use the dark one. In this situation, and only in this situation, you can actually increase here this shadow relaxation score two, four, five, six, whatever, until you also have here again a good number here at the weights. But in the usual case, you can leave it like it is. Last but not least, we have here the smoothing factor, which is by default 0.25. It's a percentage, and what it actually is influencing is how smooth or how hard the gradients are corrected. Which means in our case, 
this is a very smooth gradient, which goes actually through the whole picture as we have seen. So I can up this smoothing factor to about 0.8, for example, because I want to have it smoothed out. I do not want to have any harsh breaks in between. On the other side, if we would have, for example, vignetting, that would actually be a rather clear cut here. And then I would have to set this even to 0.1 because we don't want to smooth this over. We want to really get rid of the vignetting. So that's actually what you do with the smoothing factor. And as we are already in this section, this unweighted checkbox, what this is, if you select it, you tell the process to disregard these weights. So then it just takes full blown every sample to its full extent. Usually this is not recommended. But there might be situations where you want exactly that, and that would be the way to do that. So now that we have done all that, we go all the way, all the way down to the correction. In the correction, we can choose between subtraction and division. Division we use for equipment made issues like vignetting, for example, so something substantial. Subtraction we use to remove light pollution. So this is what we would use here. That's absolutely sufficient. So you see also here, there's some people who will tell you always use first division and then use subtraction. No, it really depends what you want to remove and you should actually, based on that, choose that. But there's a clear rule. If you want to use both, always use first division and then use subtraction. Normalization, you can actually select if without the normalization, you will have some strange colorization in there caused by the tool. Then just rerun it with the normalized. Usually you don't need it. Discard background model. If you do not want the background model, you can discard it. I wouldn't do it. It's always good to see what was actually removed. And replace target image. That is, if you do not want the new picture, but you want to actually immediately have the whole effect done on your main picture, you can select that. I would also not do that because it's good to compare the two pictures afterwards. So with that all done, we can just click the execute button and we get back two pictures. One picture is the background model. Let's have a look at it. And you can actually nicely see now the gradient, how it flows through the picture and how it was removed. And let's look now at the final picture here. So it, it looks nice. You see it right here, actually, how much nicer, how much darker it is. And if we hyperstretch it, you see it even better that now on both sides, actually, this whole thing is the same gray tone. So it very well actually removed all the light pollution. So now I said that there are two ways how you can actually do the samples. One I just showed you now, so I will show you now the other one. And for that, we clean off all the samples with the red cross here. I can delete them. So the second option we can use is here the sample generation. So I just tell the process the default size. We leave that at the moment at 30. I say how many samples I want per row. Default is 10. Let's leave it. And I just say generate. And here we have them distributed all over the picture. And I think based on what we have discussed before, you already see here the issue that we have. We have, and you see it right here, stars included. Obviously, it completely ignores if there's a star or not. Example here too, we have a star in there. So what we now have to do is manually move all these samples, which have a star included. And we'll also look at this here. So we have to find it here in the screen. We would have to move them out so that there's no star in there anymore. And that's also, that's a lot of work. The other issue that we have is if you look that some samples are now fully in the nebulosity and that's what we don't want because this could actually harm the nebulosity and remove it. So we have to manually delete these, these samples. So at the end, from my point of view, in such a situation, we probably have more work to actually correct now all the samples, remove them, shift them around, than if we would have done it from scratch from the beginning. So in such a scenario as we have here, I would absolutely not recommend to use this automatic sample generation. 
But that said, there are situations where it makes sense to use something like that. So last but not least, I want to show you something with another picture, which is a photo of the Star Cluster M5, which I took some time ago. At this point of time, I still had some issue with my flats. And as you can see, yeah, there's a lot of vignetting. So how do we get rid of this vignetting? Especially because you see there are also some other rings around here. So for that, there is actually an interesting function in the dynamic background extraction, which is not so well known. So the first thing we're doing again, we can actually increase here a little bit the default radius. And now we're starting to set a sample along these lines here. So I can hyper stretch again. So for example, that's, that's a great place here. So the transition from the light vignetting to the hard vignetting. So I set here a sample. And now I go on axial and you see we have now here a kind of a hexagon, but what we want is a circle. So we up that all the way to 24 corners, which is a, in principle, a circle. And you see also nicely now how this circle flows. So even this is actually that center of our picture. It might not be that center of our circles. And I think that's the case here. We actually have to move this a little bit. So I go in here in the center that the arrows appear. I can actually move this around. And you see now on the left side that also the circle moves. So I want actually to have the circle also around these hard edges as here. So the next thing I do is set additional samples. So every time I put it on axial, I say 24 corners and I go to the next one axial 24. I also do this to the inside. Okay. And so I think we have now the transition here from the inner side to the vignetting nicely laid out. As you can see, the outer circles, they're red. And they're red because they are too dark compared to the rest. So we go now in here, we say shadow relaxation. We put this on six. And when we do that, you see already now they actually get gray, so they're fine. But even that, with the tolerance, we also up it to about two, so that with all of them, they should be now nicely pale, and they actually are, so that's fine. With the smoothing factor, we will not smooth it out that much because these are rather harsh borders here. So we actually want to reduce it like this. So we leave the smoothing factor to 0.25. We are now setting the correction to division as this is about vignetting and the rest we can all leave it like it is we press execute if you go now first here to the, the map you nicely see now how it actually extracted circular all these these issues the vignetting and when we now look at the picture you see that the issue of the vignetting is now much smaller obviously we still have issues here we would now have to go through this picture again with a regular DB to get the rest out. But the issue with the vignetting, we have mostly resolved. And when we talk about these possibilities here in the axial area, if we unhook this again, you see there's also horizontal and you see this horizontal line here. There's also vertical and there is even diagonal. So you can actually attack gradients in different geometrical directions. So I hope I was able in this tutorial to show you the power of this process. There's so many possibilities and all have their purpose. And it's really crucial that you do not rely on certain absolutisms, but that you really get to know each of these possibilities, how they work, and that you tackle one picture at a time, analyze what the real issue is, and then find the right tools within this process to tackle it. And if you do it like this, then it's really so much more powerful than the automatic background extractor. So I hope this was helpful. And if it was, please give me a like and press the subscribe button. It's very much appreciated. See you next time and clear skies.